the harm in both looking at emotions as problems or as prizes at the fair is that if you see an emotion as a problem, you will not develop skills with it. You'll learn how to repress it or hide it or pretend you're not having it. So with that emotion, you're not going to develop any kind of vocabulary or regulation abilities because you're just running from it. It's bad. You know, run. It's that emotion. Let's go. And, and on the flip side, if you treat an emotion as positive or wanted, then you're going to overemphasize that emotion. You're going to spend too much time in that emotions world. That was Carla McLaren on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, author of Act Daily Journal, The Act Daily Card Deck, and the upcoming book, Act for Burnout. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and the upcoming Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, everyone. This is Debbie. Today, I'm bringing you a conversation with a return guest, Carla McLaren, who is talking to us all about emotions today. She has a new edition of her book, The Language of Emotions, which is a terrific resource if you want to understand your emotional experience better. And Jill is here with me today to introduce the episode. And Jill, I believe you had quite a few thoughts about the episode. Well, I think I might be Carla's new biggest fan. I think, honestly, Debbie, this is one of the best episodes we've ever done. First of all, Carla is so wise. I mean, there were so many like quotable moments in this episode. And I just think this message is so important and it's going to help so many people. And, and I hope listeners share this one. I know I'll be sharing this with like every, everybody I know, whether they want me to or not. You know, it's funny because my husband listens to the podcast occasionally. I can't say he listens to every episode. He's not in the field, but once in a while. And he, one time he said to me, you should do an episode where you talk about different emotions and why we have them and what they mean. And so this is kind of that episode. And he he thought for himself as a non-mental health professional that that would be a helpful thing to offer people. It absolutely is. And, you know, we're clinical psychologists. I feel like I know a fair amount about emotions. And even I got so much out of this episode, like so much. You know, there's always a nugget or two out of an episode, but I feel like every word of this episode was a learning <laughs> lesson for me. And, you know, you guys break down anger, shame, envy, forgiveness, anxiety. And I love if people listen to the end, you even talk about a few emotions maybe listeners haven't heard before, like panger. It was just so good. And, you know, I think maybe the, if I, I, I wrote a lot of notes and I struggled to kind of pick out the thing that I found the most valuable. I think one of those was your conversation about forgiveness. And the reason for that is it's something I've always been really confused about. It's something I've kind of struggled to talk about with my clients where I'm like, I'm not sure I know exactly what it is or how you do it or if you even should do it. Like I've struggled to have forgiveness toward people. And I thought that was because there was something wrong with me. And Carla just really, um, I, she completely shifted my perspective on forgiveness. I feel like I will be like forever changed by that part of your conversation. I'm so grateful. I love that. I'm so glad you're saying that, Jill. To me, I think that forgiveness is absolutely something where there's a lot of misconceptions, I would say misconceptions around yeah. how people think about it. I mean, even that idea of forgive and forget, it's like, that's not really going to happen. You can't yeah. forget some yeah. of these things. Well, and, and, and she talks about how often we're told to forgive by other people and that that is more about those other people wanting to feel more comfortable. And that was a real like, wow moment for me because I, I've had that experience. Have you had that experience where someone's, oh, yeah. you know, kind of like, oh, Debbie, you should just forgive and forget. And then you feel guilty. Like what's wrong with me that I can't let this go. Right. And Carla basically is like, no, get angry. 
and, yeah. you know, and talks a little bit more that, and people can listen to that in the episode, but man, it was really kind of like eye opening for me. Almost like not only is it okay to get, to be angry, but sometimes it's to really move Necessary. forward, you have to be angry. Yes. First. And you may yes. never totally get rid of that anger, but that's okay. That doesn't mean yeah. you can't move forward. You can't repair whatever the situation calls for. But I, exactly. to me, that's so validating because this idea that you're just going to suddenly magically not be angry at all anymore, like that's not going to fly in some situations. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, the conversation that you had about shame, I felt much the same way about that in terms of just sort of being like, wow, you know, I think shame is one of those emotions as humans that it might be the emotion that we work the hardest to avoid. And, you know, and this was just another just incredibly rich portion of this conversation that I think is going to really change the way our listeners think about shame and relate to shame and can honestly be healing for people. Yeah, I think you should listen to that part because I think actually that for me, the more you realize that sometimes shame is so subtle, you don't even understand that that's what's happening. And I think once you have a word for it, and once you can be on the lookout for it and look at it in this way, you'll have to listen to hear how Carla describes shame. But once you can think about it in that way, it's, it's, I think it's actually really helpful. I, de- I have definitely talked to some clients about shame. And I think they usually find it kind of almost like, oh, this makes so much sense now. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. game changer. Well, we hope that you get as much out of this episode as Jill did um, and hope you enjoy the conversation with Carla McLaren. I'm happy to welcome Carla McLaren back to the podcast today. Carla was our guest for episode number 265 about the power of emotions at work. And we're here today to talk all about emotions and her book, The Language of Emotions, What Your Feelings Are Trying to Tell You which is a 13-year-old book with a brand new revised edition that is just coming out this summer. Carla, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Well, we're glad you're here. I think one of the the words I saw that describes this book is that it's an emotional guidebook. And so today we're going to talk about why we need an emotional guidebook, why this is an important way to look at emotions. And we're going to talk through a few examples of emotions Um, that you cover in your book. But, you know, I think it's interesting that 13 years later after the book came out and the book has, the original edition was read by many, many people, that there's reason to write a new edition at this point because (laughs) things have changed in the world of our understanding of emotions. I wonder if you could just say a few words about what you notice in terms of what's changed in the last 13 years and, and what kind of changes did you need to make to update your book? I think for for me, what has changed is I understand the emotions so much better now after having worked with them. And also, uh, I've started a licensing program in my work. So now there are a whole bunch of other people coming into this awareness. And so we have uh, like this massive group of, of emotions weighing in on on what emotions are and we found out so much and sometimes i would go to the original book and and just sort of you know just sort of hold my forehead and go oh no what did i say back then i understood what i understood at the time it's like anything that you've done for 13 years i would hope that you know more now <laughs> we also know more thanks to lisa feldman barrett the researcher who has She's turned the study of emotion just on its head, and thank goodness. But we understand the really intense power of vocabulary, that knowing what your emotions are and knowing them at very specific levels of detail. So I'm not just sad. I am um, dejected. I'm despondent. I'm morose. I'm melancholic, right? To, To know that level of detail. Um, it doesn't only help you identify your, your emotional reality, but just knowing your emotions at that, that level of detail will help you regulate them all by itself with, with no other steps, simply learning an emotional vocabulary. And so I had created an emotional vocabulary list in like 2012, but it didn't get into this book. Now it's in the book. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and for myself as a clinical psychologist, I think a big part of my job is helping people do that, helping people look at their emotions and understand them and make sense of them. And it's really endlessly fascinating. I mean, I never get bored of helping people take a look at that and helping people understand their emotions better. And I think you're right, the more you're in that world and you're looking out for it, you look at it, you're looking for your own emotions and other people's emotions, you can learn some of the complexities. You're right. It's, it's sad, mad, afraid. It's much more than that. <laughs> upset. Yeah. yeah. It's like upset. That's not an How emotion. Do you feel bad. <laughs> okay. Let's unpack that. I feel, yeah. I feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that actually leads us to one of the premises of your book, which is that historically we really have looked at emotions and some emotions in particular, right? As problematic or bad, or mm -hmm. as something that we should either avoid or hide from other people or repress. And so I guess I have a two part question here. The first part is, what's the harm of taking that approach to emotions of looking at emotions as something that is a problem? The harm in both looking at emotions as problems or as prizes at the fair, is that if you see an emotion as a problem, you will not develop skills with it, you'll learn how to repress it, or hide it or pretend you're not having it. So with that emotion, you're not going to develop any kind of vocabulary or regulation abilities because you're just running from it. It's bad. You know, run. It's that emotion. Let's go. And, and on the flip side, if you treat an emotion as positive or wanted, then you're going to overemphasize that emotion. You're going to spend too much time in that emotion's world. There's a, something called a toxic positivity bias, which we see, especially in the workplace where emotions are not welcome, is that people who will only allow the supposedly positive emotions will create so much toxicity because no one will be able to speak what's true, right? It would be like, no, we, we need to put a happy face on that. We need to slap a happy face on that. And people actually lose connection with what's true the whole like community begins to fall apart because no one can say, no, I was angry right then. Or, you know, I'm afraid that this is happening, you know, that sort of thing. So to be able to not utilize all emotions is a way to actually shut down people's <laughs> neurology, basically. Yeah. And then the second part of the question is, how can your approach, which is much more about using emotions to understand ourselves better and sort of channeling them effectively, how is your approach, do you think, more beneficial? And what does it do for people in your experience using this approach with people that you've worked with and with yourself? What do you think are some of the benefits? I think there are many benefits to it. The main one is that you begin to tell the truth you begin to learn how to tell the truth about who you are and what you feel. But uh, I think a deeper benefit is that emotions carry information and wisdom. They are the things that help us attach meaning to incoming data. And without emotions, we actually can't think or have ideas or dream or behave or act. Emotions underlie all functions of a conscious well, let me say a conscious person, but also an unconscious person because emotions are working very strongly within the dream realm when you are unconscious, right? So they're always there. And learning how to work with them means sort of taking the reins of your entire life, your entire organism, your entire neurology, so that you now are connected to the things that help you make meaning and act. And if you don't have a connection you may not understand yourself very well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, and what, and we'll talk about some of the different ways that you help people do this. You have these four keys to being what you call an emotional genius. You know, it's this idea of really knowing yourself and understanding your emotions, emotional intelligence. Um, one of the keys that you yeah. offer, and I, I want to unpack a little bit is that we have to let go of this idea that some emotions are positive and some are negative. I think you kind of alluded mm -hmm. to this with the idea of toxic positivity. No. Um, but let's talk a yeah. little bit about, you know, this idea of having 
a valence to emotions and why that can be, why looking at emotions in that way can be problematic. You know, I, I talked about if you think of an emotion as bad, you're going to avoid it. And if you think of it as good, you're going to overemphasize it, right? You're going to be in that emotions territory for way too long, longer than you should be. But another thing about thinking of emotions as positive or negative, pro-social or anti-social, um, uncomfortable or comfortable, is that it places emotions in categories that they don't actually that aren't actually true. For instance, with anger is supposed to be a negative emotion that's antisocial and uncomfortable, but it feels great to be yeah. angry, <laughs> right? So if you go to like, how do I feel when I'm angry? I'm like, I'm powerful. Or uh, fear and panic, you would say those are negative emotions. Uh, but what about people who love to go to horror films? right? They love those emotions. They're just having so much, you know, delight in them. Or grief is considered a negative emotion. But if you try to get through the loss of something or someone important to you without grief, you're going to see what negative is, because you're not going to be having access to the emotion that actually can help you. And there are the so-called positive emotions, happiness, contentment, and joy, if you stay too long in happiness and you refuse to look at anything else, then we're looking at a toxic positivity bias. Too much joy can lean into mania, right? You can lose your sense of proportion and and the things that your other emotions would have brought to you. <laughs> the anger would have said, excuse me, what are you doing right now? <laughs> and, and fear would say, you're scaring me because you're off on a tangent right now, right? So so if you just try to have the supposedly positive emotions, your life can spin very negative very quickly, but people sort of don't look at it that way, yeah. right? And the supposedly negative emotions, you require them, and if you're missing them, things don't go well. It reminds me of that movie Inside Out and how that all these different emotions sort of have to be there. In the beginning, there's the sense that some are better than others, but you see how they all have to work together and they're all there for a reason. I tell my clients. Yeah. And I think that movie doesn't, doesn't sadness yes. eventually yeah. save the day. That's right. Sadness is exiled or something. And then the sadness goes right. and fixes everything while the other ones are like, what do we do? Um, that's the kind of thing I like to see. It's like, Oh yeah, these emotions are necessary. And if you don't have them, Something's going to go That's wrong. Right. Yeah. And I like to remind yeah. my clients that they're all there for a reason. Every single one of them, they're wired into us and they serve a purpose. And I think sometimes we forget that because some of them we, you know, have learned we shouldn't, we shouldn't really want. So yeah. as I read your book, you share a lot about your personal history. And I read some more, uh, some of your essays on your webpage that go a bit in, more into that. And what I think is really interesting about your story. And I'm going to probably just nutshell your history a little bit, which might be a strange thing to hear. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. But, you know, you write about how you have a trauma history from childhood. And you were for many years involved mm -hmm. in kind of the new age spiritual world, which you eventually left and went toward a more academic study of emotions. You know, you did some research, got your master's degree. But what I think is really interesting, mm -hmm. because you've had that history, I think that your approach blends some aspects of all of them, right? So there is this personal understanding. There's a very strong academic and research-based mm -hmm. understanding of emotion, sort of an intellectual framework for it. And then you also encourage people to do mm -hmm. some of that deep work with emotions to help them kind of listen deeply to their own emotions. And also you present how emotions can help people heal from past, from their past history, like traumatic events they've experienced and that kind of thing. And so I was wondering if you could just say mm -hmm. a little bit about, you know, first of all, how, how you blend those and how emotions can be useful in that way in terms of deep self-understanding and healing from trauma. In other words, how do you think that those three sort of come together in your framework? Well, I think you're right. This is a lived experience approach of emotion, right? And then going and getting some research support, although it was hard to get because 
psychology, psychiatry, and neurology are very strongly valenced, right? So the emotions are very strongly valenced there. And a lot of times when I would read studies about the downsides of happiness or something, people would call this a confounding um, result, right? This is so confusing. How can a positive emotion be negative? I was like, because valencing is not where you should be with this, right? And they would find, for instance, um, slightly depressed people are more realistic than optimistic people, right? Not all the way depressed, (laughs) just slightly depressed. And they would say, this is confounding, right? But depression is an emotion that gives you a reality check. And sometimes you need a reality check, right? Especially if you're traipsing along with your happiness, it's all going to be good. This relationship's going to be great. And I don't have to check mm-hmm. in with anything, right? And your depression says, excuse me, no, you have to check in. Um, so, so working with emotions in the way that I did coming out of, you know, really severe trauma history um, and a pretty severe mental illness as well. I like most people learn to see emotions as the problem, right? They're the problem. And I would, you know, think to myself, I would go from the age of like 10 onward, I would go into severe suicidal depressions and they would just come up of their own volition. I didn't know what started it. You know, there was no rhyme or reason to it. And I would just try to get through whatever way I could. And I would think to myself, you know, my life would be perfect if it wasn't for these damned depressions, like if they would leave me alone, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? If I could just get rid of this. And I finally went into the depression and I, you know, looked at it and said, what in the hell do you want from me? And I think I was in my twenties and I, I was ready to be hit over the head with an anvil, right? I was ready to be abused and yelled at and screamed at and told that I was no good. I was ready for the whole thing. I'm like, let's, let's do this, man. I've got my dukes up. We're going. And, uh, and all of a sudden everything went blank. And I saw an image of uh, parents in London at a train station, sending their children to the, um, the countryside. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, that I, where's my fight? Okay. I, so there was no fight. So was, all of a sudden I was in this other world and I saw that what my depression was doing was taking away the children of my soul because there was a war in London and it was likely that we were going to be bombed and shelled. So there was this imagery that I was able to pick up I mean, I'm a writer, so I have a very vivid imagination, right? Um, so, so I saw that depression was taking my energy away because it wasn't safe where I was. And I kind of came out of that sort of, you know, awareness or vision. And I looked around at my life and like, yeah, my mm. life isn't good. <laughs> you know, I was in the middle of a very dangerous relationship and I wasn't safe at all. My son wasn't safe. And I was blaming depression. I was making a fundamental, you know, um, emotional attribution mistake. I was blaming depression for what was going on. And it was depression that was trying to deal with what was going on. Yeah. Right. (laughs) The depression was telling me the absolute truth of the situation. And I was, no, I can figure it out. Blah, blah, blah. I came up against a brick wall of, of understanding. And that was kind of where I began to understand the emotions much more clearly after that point. Uh, And each of the emotions has its own reason for arising that is supportive. And if we think of them as negative, we're going to be like me saying, my life would be great if except for these damned, you know, these damned emotions. Um, So for me, that was like a very freeing thing. And it's, it's more poetic, right? It's more sort of like Jungian depth therapy level of understanding that isn't very, um, that isn't very accessible with people, you know, trying to manage emotions or downregulate emotions or be in control of emotions. So there's a couple of things I want to highlight from what you said, because one is that you have a chap or you have, you have a section of your book about situational depression. And that's so interesting to me because I see that a lot. It, there was this 
meme going around a while where it said, maybe you're not depressed. Maybe you're just surrounded by assholes. And I thought sometimes, right, sometimes that's the case that we are so busy trying to get rid of our depression and not always, but you know, sometimes depression just sort of comes up for whatever reason. But there are times when people, if you actually stop trying to fight your depression and ask, what is the function of it? What's it doing for me? You know, there's some information there, as you said. And I think I just really appreciate that you had your own personal experience with that, that, that led you to this point and that people can do similar work in terms of whatever emotions they might be struggling with. And how transformative Mm -hmm. it can be. Yeah, they're all there for a reason. They all have a healing purpose. Yeah. Um, Now, I do have to say that um, I had been, I I was raised in the new age in alternative medicine. So I was kind of um, indoctrinated against uh, modern medicine, basically conventional medicine. And so I didn't even think of going to antidepressants. But when I hit... um, menopause and my hormones went cattywampus, my depression went cattywampus too. And so I was on a really good antidepressant for about a year um, that, you know, literally saved my life. So I wouldn't say like, let's all just, let's all just throw away the medication and just deal with it. There are many instances, especially with long-term depression, as you know, where it can get, it can where a kind of a groove in the brain and you learn to be depressed. So there's an unlearning that needs to happen if you have, you know, very long term. That's a good point. Thank you. I'm glad you said yeah. that. And and another piece, and I think you alluded to this a little bit, but I, I think this is another thing I see a lot is around, you know, sometimes people who have had a trauma history or who have just learned how to be out of touch with their emotions, maybe they never learned to be in touch with their emotions, can almost be disconnected or dissociated from their emotional experience. Can you say a little bit about that and how your approach can help when when people are experiencing that disconnect? I think it's the movement of the modern world. Or maybe you know, it's been centuries that we've been told that emotions aren't okay and that emotions are lower than spirituality, certainly. Um, and uh, at this point, we've also got the untrue idea of the triune brain. You know, it's, it's not a thing. Like the amygdala is where all the emotions are. And then you've got this really smart brain above the top of it that can manage it. It's all nonsense. That's not how the brain works. But that's a very powerful fairy tale that we have in our culture, right? that emotions are primitive. And what I say instead is no emotions are ancient, Mm. right? And so they have an ancient wisdom that we can tap into. And when people know that their emotions are a part of their entire brain, emotions are found everywhere in the brain. There's not just like a little emotion place. Um, And that's another thing that Lisa Feldman Barrett has helped us understand that emotions are involved in everything. They're not they're not hidden in a part of the brain Um, that to help people understand, no, your emotions have been with you your entire life and they've been watching what's been happening. Each of them has a piece of wisdom. And if you would think of your body, you don't have a positive negative connotation to any of the other parts of your body. You don't say, I love my lungs, but my (laughs) stomach has to go. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't do that. Um, it would be the same to say, I love happiness, but I don't want any of that anger, right? That, that we've been taught to sort of dissemble our, dis, disassemble our, our psyche. And in so doing, we lose connection to ourselves. So yes, people can be very dissociated from emotion. Um, but what I found is the emotions are never dissociated from us. So even if we don't think we're angry, if you understand anger as your capacity to understand what you value and set boundaries, I would just watch, okay, so where are you setting boundaries? Yeah. There's your anger, right? It's always been there, right? Your fear is your intuition and your instincts. Are you a fairly intuitive person? Mm. There's your fear, right? Just to help people. It's like uh, emotions are working invisibly all the time. Yeah, that's right. They're in there somewhere. You're just not sort of paying attention or accessing them or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, we've been yeah. trained away from them. We've really been trained away from emotion. 
And one other thing, yeah. and you have a whole chapter on this too, is that we get into avoidance behaviors, addictions, distractions, and and you write a whole chapter about this. And I think that's an interesting thing because, well, often we, you know, I mean, who doesn't have some form of that that they, they get pulled into from time to time, right? Do you? But sometimes those are really underlying that is that same desire to kind of maybe check out from your experience a little bit, would you say? I think distractions can be so important, right? If you know you're doing them, right? To be able to say, um, there's a wonderful book called The End of Trauma by George Bonanno, and he calls it coping ugly. So if I'm just just Netflixing my way through this situation. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? And I'm, yeah, chocolating and um, reading trash novels. Um, I'm coping. Mm-hmm. This is my coping mechanism. It's just ugly right now. And to be able to say that to yourself instead of bec- remaining unconscious about your Netflixing and your chocolating, right? To to sort of be a uh, a bystander in your own right. behavior. Yeah, I think there's yeah. a big difference, right? Yeah. Choosing that, hey, it's been a long day. I'm going to do Netflix and chocolate tonight. And that and that shift from being entirely unconscious about something to becoming conscious of it. That's a difficult shift to make because now you've got to look at why was I doing that? Right? What is underneath here? You know, that might need some support. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. Okay, the part of your book that I most highlighted, um, dog-eared, underlined, I have stars, I don't know if you can see it, but but it's so important, and I really (laughs) love your take on this, is about real forgiveness, right? So the relationship between the process of forgiveness and anger. And I think I love your take on this so much because I think there are so many misconceptions about what forgiveness means and I think what people maybe expect it Mm -hmm. to be. Um, so actually Mm -hmm. I want to, can I just read a couple quotes from this that I (laughs) start and and then I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about this. Um, first of all, you write about how anger and forgiveness kind of go together, right? Quote, real forgiveness does not make excuses for other people's improper behavior. Real forgiveness does not tell itself that everyone always does the best they know how, because that's preposterous. Do you always do your best? Do I? Of course not. And then you say, and this is a little bit later in the next page, that it looks very evolved and saintly on the outside to have this sort of demure head bowing type of forgiveness. 
but it has some unhealthy effects in the inner world. It excuses the behavior of others and reduces our ability to be conscious and present with the pain we truly feel. I love that because I think sometimes people yeah. expect to forgive and forget or to just not care anymore. So this got me fired up, as you can tell. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your stance on forgiveness and, and why this is important? I think as a trauma survivor, I got told to forgive a lot, right? And what I realized eventually is that it was for the comfort of the person telling me, right? They didn't want me to be suffering. They didn't want me to be angry. They, they were trying to control my experience. And I'm a very feisty person. So if people are wanting to control me, <laughs> sorry, pal, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but uh, what I realized is people can also sort of do that to themselves by making excuses for the people who have hurt them. I understand that he was having a difficult time and, you know, he also had this experience when he was young. So he was just acting out on me What that blah, blah, blah. I see people going to their first and it is almost as if they have become an attorney mm. for the accused. <laughs> and I was like, that person needs to go get their own attorney, right? That's you're the victim. And I think that's difficult for people to say, I was the victim. Rather, they want to like have some power over it, right? To say, I forgive you, which now makes me a, some kind of a martyr or something. Um, or I understand why you did that. What for me was the, the healing process was to get good and angry and enraged about what I had been put through at the hands of this person's illness and, you know, the abuse that I experienced and to be enraged for as long as I wanted to be just rage, rage, rage. And eventually when I had done enough raging and anger resets boundaries, when I had restored my boundaries with the emotion that does that, which is anger, um, I could all of a sudden look at my molester as set separate from me making terrible decisions that were entirely his responsibility and nothing whatever to do with me. But before that I had blown out boundaries, which most childhood assault survivors have blown out boundaries. They don't know where they are. They, they learn to sort of read everybody because their life is unsafe. Right? So once I had reestablished my boundaries, I could then look at him and go, well, I don't forgive you in the way like uh, it wasn't a crime. But I, because you need to go to jail. But, um, but I see that that the person who was most wounded was you, because the person who hurts people is the most powerless in the room. Nobody who has real sense of power is going to go hurting others, right? That's not what it looks like. Um, so it was like re reestablishing my own sense of self, my own sense of agency and autonomy, understanding power, understanding, you know, it's like there was a whole th bunch of things that happened that would never have happened if I would have just done that saintly forgiveness that everybody wanted me to do. I understand that you blah, 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 blah. And what that does is it makes me his attorney and nobody's my attorney. Nobody's, nobody's my advocate. I've just, I'm continuing in the boundaryless state that I was yeah. put into, right? Forgiveness, I think, requires that kind of yeah. fury. Um, if someone's really injured you, uh, to be able to and set your boundaries back. You know, whether it's something major like what you're talking about, or even smaller, you know, day to day grievances, um, behaviors, I would say that I think it's to imagine that you're just going to, jump to this place where you're so saintly and forgiving and you don't care anymore and you're, it's okay that this happened or anger is completely gone. It's just not, I mean, maybe it's even realistic for some people. I don't know, but I think often it's not realistic, but also it's like, you're not honoring your emotions in response to that. You know, sometimes it's, it's okay yeah. that you're mad about the way that this treat person treated you. That actually doesn't have to go away for you to move forward. I just really appreciate that, that, that you yeah. point that out. <clears throat> yeah. And I have to say that I've seen people do that saintly forgiveness, like with their 
grandmother and then get into relationships that are exactly yeah. like yeah. the relationship with the grandmother because it's not finished. Like that was a ritual that got started and that ritual has not ended. And so they just go have it. I saw this for myself in my 20s when I would get into jobs and I was like, okay, I have all my clothes on as nobody's touching me in a sexual way, but this feels exactly like mm, being molested, yeah. right? I was like, oh, okay. So I'm still in this world. I'm still in this situation. So what do I do to get out of it? You know, you know it's like, this reminds me of something. Uh, That's yeah. right. It can feel familiar over and over again until yeah. you, yeah. Until yeah. you reset yeah. your boundary, going back to that original one and each one after and be like, no, yeah. I am not yeah, your I love attorney. that metaphor for it. You need to go get one. <laughs> I'm not here to defend you, right? <laughs> so the bulk of your book, the main part about, I'd say probably about two thirds of your book is this very comprehensive, as you said, it's, it's almost like a a guidebook to your emotions. It goes through different emotion families and breaks down different emotions and really unpacks them. Um, and I think what, and, and for each one, it, um, it goes through some of the messages that the emotion contains, what can be learned from them, some practices for learning from them or embracing them. And so I thought it might be fun. I think people need to read the book because you go through so many just, but as a couple of examples, I thought it might be fun to highlight a few and maybe a few emotions that people that, that are maybe less obvious or people that don't talk about quite as much. Um, so mm-hmm. let's start with shame. Could you talk a little bit about shame, um, a, which I think is often one that we categorize as a negative emotion um, or that people might want to overlook or turn away from. So what is, what's the function of shame mm-hmm. and, and what, how might shame be a helpful thing to, to be aware of? I love shame. Love it because everybody (laughs) hates it. So I'm just an opposite person. No, because, but shame is kind of a, a a sibling emotion to anger. Anger helps you set boundaries from the outside. So it helps you identify what you value. And if people step across your boundaries, some form of anger should come forward to help you say, Hey, that's not all right. Shame is Uh, an internal boundary setting emotion that helps you maintain the values, ethics, and um, morals that you agree with so that if you start stepping across what you've agreed to, your shame should come up and say, hey, that's not a thing. So the problem with shame is that most of us have learned about shame by being shamed, right? So the shame doesn't come from within our own moral structure. It comes from exterior sources, many of whom are abusive, right? So if I have something in my moral structure that says I want to floss every night, that is a livable agreement that I and my shame, that's cool. So if it's at, it's 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock and I haven't flossed yet, my shame will say, hey, uh, hey, uh, what's going on? I was like, oops, I didn't floss, right? That's me and my shame working together on an agreement that is livable. But what if I got an agreement that says no one will ever love you until you're perfect, right? And that's part of my moral and ethical structure. Shame is going to help me live up to it. I don't know where I got that picture from. Maybe <laughs> from Instagram. I don't know that's where it came driver. from. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they go for some shame at Instagram. Um, but if some poor soul comes to love me, my shame is going to go on a bender. My shame is going to go banana crackers, right? It's going to be like, you can't be loved. Blah, 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 blah. And all those messages are going to come up. And if I don't understand shame, I'm going to say shame is the worst emotion that's ever lived right? I won't understand that it's the message underneath that shame is helping me uphold. So because it's an emotion of values, ethics, and, and, and rules, right? The work of shame is to understand whose values and ethics are these? Are they mine? Are they livable? Are they appropriate? Are they from the present moment? Because, I mean, like you could have um, children are best seen and not heard, and you're 35 and you're having a really hard mm. time in board meetings. 
because you're still, I was like, no, you're not a child anymore. But your shame's like, I, you, I have this as a contract. You, you signed it when you were seven. Right. So there's, there's the work with shame is to make sure that all of your ethics and morals belong to you. And so it is the emotion of self realization, self actualization. But if you don't know that about shame, you would just think, I never want to feel shame. Shame is the worst feeling in the world. It's a terrible emotion and it's going to murder us all in our sleep. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So yeah, so misunderstanding or mis, mis, uh, misattributions of shame onto the contract that is, or the agreement that it is upholding is one of the hugest uh, emotional um, confusions that people can make. That's really helpful, I think, where it yeah, kind of crosses that line into something that's important to something that's not working. And one of the things you mentioned this in your book, and I, I sometimes think about this, especially with shame prone clients, is how often we want to hide when we're shamed, right? And when we feel yeah. ashamed, when we feel shame, we want to bury that deep or not let other people see it. And it's really the opposite that yeah. needs to happen to move forward. Yeah. 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 To be able to say, what is this? What is this agreement? Where's this ethic from? Where's this moral from? Do I agree with it now today? And if not, yeah, I'm going to rewrite it. And that can get you unstuck. Okay. Another emotion that I think is also similarly sometimes misunderstood or overlooked is envy. Tell us a little bit about envy. Now, envy is one of the seven deadly sins. So we see how Catholics feel about envy. And the seven deadly sins, I think five of them are human emotions. Pride, lust, you know, uh, anger. Yeah, I think there's a lot going on there. So envy and its sibling emotion, jealousy, I call them the sociological emotions because their work is to um, situate us appropriately in social groups. These are the social emotions. Shame is also a social emotion. Um, Envy, I call it interactional radar. Its work is to help us maintain our mm, safety and stability and sort of boundaries around access to resources, uh, money, things, recognition, and approval, right? So it is, what is our sort of social capital? Envy is involved in that. Jealousy, its sibling emotion, is about love, commitment, and close relationships, right? So a lot of times they work together. Um, Children who grow up with siblings deal with a lot of jealousy and envy. And sadly, most parents Mm. will crush it. Right. Because it's not, you don't want to hear kids always whining about how it's not fair. But (laughs) um, helping children really hone their idea of fairness is such an important thing, or anybody's fairness. With jealousy and envy, the work with a sort of a mature jealousy and envy that people have been allowed to work with is I need to make sure that everybody else has the love they need. I need to make sure that everybody else has the things they need, right? Because then we're going to have a happy community, right? We're going to have a happy social group and it's not just me. So for a lot of, a lot of us, our connection to jealousy and envy was broken in childhood. So we sort of have that sometimes self self-centered child behavior around our jealousy and envy. And that's not jealousy and envy's fault. That's not the heart of jealousy and envy. So we learn in this work to work with them directly. And, you know, when we see something like, I hate it when she gets the thing that I did and just pull back and go, could it be okay for her to have the thing Mm. and for you to want the thing? You know, this is going to directly impact my parenting because I'm going to start talking to my kids about this more because I pointed out to them, I think it was just this weekend that they were so fixated. I was pouring them each a beverage and they were so fixated about making sure they were exactly the same. They were like looking, (laughs) making sure the line was even. And I said, do you really care that much if your sister gets a teaspoon more of this than you do. And 
I think I maybe missed an opportunity <laughs> to teach them something about envy <laughs> because yeah, that's a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah, one of the one of the, a good way to work with kids on that. Um, my sister and I were very competitive, and my mom would have one of us pour or cut, yeah, and the other one. choose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the pouring and cutting person had to be really, right. really yes. precise. <laughs> uh, maybe we need to teach them a little generosity too. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, another yeah. emotion, um, which I had. had Interestingly, not really thought about much as an emotion. Apathy. What's going on with apathy, Carla? <laughs> I, I love, love how you delight in each love emotion that I, I name. You just get this big smile on your face. <laughs> I can see Carla on the video. You should see her beaming about each and every one of these emotions. <laughs> It's like, I get to go to apathy Yay, town. Apathy. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I call apathy the mask for anger. Because if anger is about boundaries and what we value, if you look at apathy, this is a person setting a boundary, especially if you look at like teenage apathy, whatever, I don't care, whatever, they are appearing to not care, but they're definitely setting a boundary around it. And what I found about apathy is that it will come up when we are in a situation where our voice, our values and our needs are not important either because we're in a yucky place or because it's a, you know, it's biology 101. You just got to get through it. It's not about you at all. And so to become aware when we're apathetic and what I learned to do with my apathy when I was really trapped in a place that wasn't for me at all was to go into my imagination. So I would doodle and things like that. So the thing that I ask about apathy is, um, why is this place not built for you in any way, shape or form? Why are you here? What's, what's going on? And then sometimes when I'm in a place where I cannot, there's nothing I can do. I start creating a place that would be better. Right. So it's like, there's a learning thing. I know this place is nothing and I'm just going to, put down my mask of apathy and inside my psyche, I'm going to build a place that would work. And it sort of helps me get into this dreaming, you know, where I get my agency back, I get my autonomy back. But, uh, you know, adolescents are plagued by apathy because their world isn't built for them. It's built to Mm. control them. It's built to educate them. It's right. It's built to teach them, but it's mm. not built for them. And you know, until they're eighteen, they're the eighteen. They're actually not legal entities, right? A child has no legal standing. Um, and my son, when he was in that age, he came out and he said, <clears throat> "Like, why do I have to clean my room? It's my only space. It's literally the only space I own." And he said, you guys can have your stuff out in the living room, in the dining room, in the kitchen, in your own bedroom in here. And my room is still not mine. And I went, <laughs> your honor, <laughs> I concede my case. <laughs> so I said, so here's what I would ask. Please don't take food in there. Then okay. your room yeah. is your own. Yeah. Right. He made a really good, right? It was a really good argument. And I looked around at the kitchen table. I was like, oh, he got me there. <laughs> Flexible parenting. You can admit when <laughs> your child has a point. I, oh, I was wrong. My shame was like, yeah. he's made a point here. <laughs> and my envy was like, is it fair for everyone? No, it's not. So listen to him. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I want to ask about one more final emotion. And this one probably isn't one of the lesser known emotions or lesser acknowledged emotions. This one, I think we hear about a lot, (laughs) but I I just wanted to hear your thoughts about it because I think so many people might find themselves struggling this with this one, but can you just say a little bit about anxiety and worry and what, what they're there for and why we might want to honor those particular emotions as well? My friend, anxiety, uh, in the original language of emotions, there was no anxiety chapter because I thought anxiety was a problem. I also wrote a book in, I think, 2021 
or 2020 called Embracing Anxiety about how to work with anxiety. What I found when I was doing my research for the book is that almost everybody confuses anxiety with panic. And so the, the emotion of anxiety helps us plan for the future. And what it does is it makes sure that we have everything we need to complete our tasks and hit our deadlines. So anxiety has a lot of energy, but it's also a forward leaning emotion. So it can be ungrounding just in its own self. If there is any sense of dread or danger, then another emotion has come in and that's panic. And panic is the emotion that saves our life. So it has the fight, flee, freeze, flock to safety actions, right? And for a lot of people, anxiety and panic are fused as if it's two hands, you know, holding each other and not letting go. So for a lot of people, when they're talking about anxiety, they're talking about panic. And so that's a big confusion in the, you know, in our emotional understanding, but anxiety is such an important emotion. It's the emotion of your motivation. It's the emotion of getting things done. So you literally can't do anything without your anxiety, but if it is extremely hand holding with your panic, it could be very uncomfortable because as we know, anxiety has energy and panic has a whole heck of energy. So you could be riled up most of the day with these two emotions. And if you're feeling any sense of dread or danger, there's panic in it, right? So that's one big thing is trying to you know, the work is to like separate these two emotions. And when I get in a kind of a heightened state, I check with the panic first. And I say, am I in danger of losing my life right now? And panic will say, um, mm-hmm. no, <laughs> and I say, but are there tasks and deadlines that are coming up? And anxiety mm. will say, yes, this one's yeah. mine. <laughs> I'll say, okay, panic. Let's see if we can just like soothe it out a little bit. Thank you for coming and checking to see that I wasn't going to be murdered by my tasks and deadlines. That's very thoughtful of you. So it's sort of like getting into a, you know, a calm relationship with panic and always asking, am I in physical danger right now? Is my life in danger? That's panic's job. And you need panic, right? You need it to be on the task all the time. Um, panic will jump out when, you, you know, all of a sudden someone drives into you, you know, they just, they don't know you're there in the fast lane, boom, your panic needs to be right there. So there are times when panic is very appropriate. And for some reason, anxiety and panic are strongly connected in modern people. Yeah, I, I appreciate that distinction between those, because I think sometimes we use these words so generally that we don't think about these subtle differences between these different, yeah, experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like when people say anxiety attack, and I was like, yeah, there's yeah. panic in that because <laughs> anxiety doesn't attack you. Well, and then another one of your four keys of emotional genius has to do with identifying multiple emotions that might be occurring at the same time. And you actually have some words that I really appreciated for blends of emotions. Could you give a couple of examples of those? Because it's often the case, right, that we're not just feeling one emotion and that's it in any given moment. Usually there's several, especially in an emotionally intense situation. Yeah. Well, with pan- panic and anxiety, we call it panxiety. <laughs> with um, panic and anger, uh, anger does not in and of its own self have a fight action. There's no fight action in anger. If you're fighting, you're in the fight, flee, free emotion of panic, right? Um, so it's panger. And we say, <laughs> am I in anger or panger? Hold on. I have to check. Am I in danger right now? You know, and then get panic to stand down. Okay, let me say this with anger. Let me set a boundary about what I value, right? But most people, pa- panic and anger are as, as, as linked. Panic has a lot to do in modern people. I'm really interested in how much work this emotion is doing. Because really, it should be like like uh, laying under a tree in a hammock and having a mint julep most of the time. <laughs> And instead, it's up with every emotion. So it's interesting to see. I was like, Panic, what are you doing here? 
I was like, I was called to the party. That's a good point because we're not really, I mean, in the modern world, how often are you really in a life or death situation? I mean, I'm not very often, I have to say. Yeah, I right, tigers right. are not coming at me, but my panic is like it could have happened. Yeah, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So what do we have? Also, we have pangerziety, which is <laughs> panic, an- <laughs> panic, anger, and anxiety. Um, there's a what was I having the other day? Oh, um, depressed anxiety, which is depression and anxiety, which are two weird emotions to have together. Because one gives you all the energy and one takes your energy away. So having those two together is like a, an amazing juggling yeah, act. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I do <laughs> think so part of the work here and people, I really, really recommend taking a look at your book so that you can get some strategies for how to look at your own emotions. And some of these, you know, just ideas about the individual emotions themselves. And then you can start to notice you know, maybe what's the most prominent one, what else is in there too. And I think as you do this, as you go through the process and read the book and really pay attention to your emotions, you will become the emotional genius that Carla talks about and it will serve you very well. And your emotions will be so happy. They'll be like, oh my gosh, they're listening to me. Carla and say, yay, envy, I love envy. (laughs) Be the cheerleader for them all, right? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Go emotional. Well, Carla, thank you so much for coming back on the show. And um, people can find you. We'll post to your website and some of and the book and some of your other resources mm-hmm. on our show notes. But where can people find you if they want to look for your some of your fabulous essays and your trainings and your books? Where can people find you online? They can find me at my site, CarlaMcLaren.com. And I also have an online learning site called Empathy Academy. Dot org And I teach on there and so do uh, my licensees. And we have some beautiful courses every month. Yes. And I, I follow you on social media and I believe I get your newsletter. And so there are some really interesting, you know, you feature different emotions and you have some wonderful writing that you do that just helps me stay current on what's happening in the world of emotions. So thank you, Carla, for providing that content for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter and connecting with us on social media. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, and our podcast production manager, Jadine Stout-Williams. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.